Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the THO Movie Reviews podcast, the show where we bring you passionate, honest, and insightful film criticism. I'm your host, Ben Campbell Ferguson. I'm here today at Rose City Coffee Hill, Brooklyn Park. I'm going to talk about some of our favorite films of 2019, and to do that, I'm joined by two of my wonderful colleagues, starting with the man who is a great guardian of the galaxy that is cinema. It's Mo Chanet. I That is high praise. That wow. is thoroughly undeserved, but thank you. It's, fr- it's from the heart. <laughs> Not from the head, hey, but from the heart. You're someone's guardian. Well, the, the from, from the head and the heart. I try, to, you know, I try to mix the two, you know, to create a good like head heart milkshake. It's and, you know, it's mm, head heart milkshake. Delicious. I, I like to think it works out all. The I, think, I think that's a whole. That's an old Hannibal Lecter recipe. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. And also here we have. A man who you should hit him up on Facebook while you still can. It's <laughs> Maxwell Myers. I'll be on Twitter. I'm going to try and be a better Twitterer. Max, what don't you like about a, a giant uh, social media empire that spreads lies and uh, causes anxiety and depression? Like, you you what, know, what's, what's, what's your issue with, with this? Oh, man. I feel the like... layout could use some work. <laughs> I don't like the algorithm. <laughs> like, you just had to know. I mean, several things, but I don't need to get into that I'd rather talk about better things. Well said. Well said. Better things, not the show. I assume. Oh, I just the better things. There was there was a show. <laughs> oh, I missed it. Was, it. it yeah, I haven't seen it. No. I, I, I watched the first few episodes. It's pretty good. Um, Pamela Adlon. That's who. That's <gasps> oh, who it is. Oh yeah, she got some love for that. Yeah. But Louis C.K. produced it, so I don't know how we're supposed to feel yeah. about it. <laughs> All right. Well, getting on, uh, getting on down to uh, movie business. Uh, so we're, we we each picked uh, three films, three of our favorite films of the year. That we're going to talk about. Uh, my friends here have ranked theirs. I have uh, I have not ranked mine because you know it's, I'm I'm still in a in a kind of indecisive place where I'm like like. I don't know. Do I like this? <laughs> or, like, or maybe they should move this up one spot. Or wait, no. Like, I don't know. Should this even be on the list? You know, oh, going ben, through all that, you know, that long rabbit hole, the madness of this ranking that's totally arbitrary, and yet I, you know, I treat it as if it were the most important thing in the universe because in 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 my universe, you know, who are we kidding? It kind of is. It's like picking your favorite child of the year. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I have, you know. I have so many, so many wonderful children, let me tell you. Oh, um, man. But uh, <laughs> which of you guys would uh, like to start us off? I guess it's me then. All right. Um, so for my number three, this is some. This is a movie that uh, uh, came out a while ago. A lot of our picks, I suspect, will be around now because it's Oscar season. So everyone like drops everything in in in, in fall and winter, um, and also because you know the big uh, the festivals have played. So we know what's 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 going to be big. What people are responding to. Um, but for my number three pick, it's actually going to be us. Written and directed by Jordan well chosen, Peele. Well chosen. The set, his his sophomore feature. Um, I, as I've said, I, I, po- probably here. I am usually not one for horror movies. I don't like getting scared. It's not something I'm comfortable with. Um, but I friggin' loved Get Out, and then I I was excited to see what would happen next. And what did happen is something completely different, and yet entirely of the same vein. It's not. It, it's it's a different kind of horror movie. It's it's uh, it's a lot more visceral. It's a lot weirder right off the bat. Um, it's still got ideas, but it's not very up. It's not as upfront about it. But yet, it's still just a really great ride. And it's it's a phenomenal cast. Play, a lot of them play all of them playing two roles, two distinct characters, and yet making them both seem vibrant and 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 connected, connected, and just really alive on screen. Um, it's just a phenomenal piece of work, and it was supremely entertaining, and I loved it. You know, I, I really something you just said really resonates with me. I mean, you, you said that you know you don't you don't like getting scared. Yeah, typically you're not typically one for horror movies. I mean, like I've I found that to be the case 
with myself, and, and yet I have a horror movie on my list that I have to talk about later in this Ooh. podcast. I feel like um, there is one movie that's kind of a horror movie that's on all of our lists, but we'll get to it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, this, this speaks to something really interesting is that, I mean, you know, I think there's an expectation that any critic can, you know, enjoy any kind of film. And we all know that's not true. You know, we're all, you know, more drawn to certain genres or kinds of movies than others. But, like, I, I think what you what, what you just said speaks to is that, you know, I mean, you know, with the right movie, you know, sometimes going outside your comfort zone can not only be, uh, you know, an interesting experience, it can also be a pleasure. I mean... I, I also loved us. Uh, it was on my. It was actually on my my short list. I, I think I broke down my list. To think, I was thinking we were going to do five, and I think I after reviewing the whole year I had eight. And us was on my list. I think my favorite part is Lupita Nyong'o. Uh, I love a movie that's really well written, and I think us once you reach the end, unlike some horror movies, you're like, oh shit, I gotta see that again. And, like, immediately, like, everything has a different meaning of the second time around. It feels well, when we different. reviewed it, that was the second time you'd seen it, Yes, right? and I felt, I think if you go back to our review, there's a little, there's a little difference, and I think there are a few movies, I mean, there are some movies that are, like, so good, you're like, I'd watch that again, but yep. there's so few movies I'm like, I need to watch this a second time. I feel like it warrants two viewings to really fully understand it, and it's really sad that it's uh, dropped off the awards talk this year, because, I mean, well, I can't Nyong'o, though, I, Absolutely. there's been buzz for her performance, and rightly so. I mean, or her two performances, yeah. I should say. I mean, but they, they've sadly been forgotten. I mean, they're unlike Marriage Story, which I just watched. I don't know if I'll ever watch that again. This, <laughs> I mean, Us was one I was like, I need to watch this again. I have to, like, to fully understand it. And I think that's why a lot of people have forgotten about it is because I don't think they realize, you know. It takes a little more work, but you can't just like watch it and be like, ah, I got why this is brilliant in one move. Like, I think it takes two, and that's a bold move. I think that was great, uh, but there was just some other stuff that meant a little bit more to me this year. That's why I didn't end up on mine. I think, you know, a couple, you know, recent breakthroughs aside, the Academy still has like a, a definite bias against genre entertainment, and, and maybe even horror more than, you know, sci-fi or fantasy. I mean, you know, Silence of the Lambs won Best Picture, and, you know, I Get Out won Best Screenplay. Those are really there's, exceptions. There's outliers, not definitely. There's also, um, what was it? Was Rose, Rosemary's Baby won some stuff, didn't it? I don't know. I think it was I nominated. I finally watched that a couple months I ago. I think it was nominated. <laughs> I don't think it won anything. Mm-hmm. And I think they left out uh, the acting category. I think that's why everybody talks about it. But And it's a shame because I'm, uh, there's real craft and discipline in us, you know, much as there was in Get Out, you know, and, and Jordan Peele was justly nominated for that, but, you know, I, he's, he's obviously, you know, a brilliant, brilliant storyteller, you know, I, I hope there's more love uh, awards related and otherwise, because, you know, I know he's, I think, I think he's doing at least, he's got at least two more movies he's playing right now. Good. I'm yeah. sure. I mean, like, I, there's... I, I would not doubt it because both of his last ventures were hugely profitable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, let's just like let's just take a moment to marvel at a seventy million opening weekend. That's how much cats lost. So, yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Us made more, uh, enough in one weekend, as much wow. in one weekend that cats lost. And, and cats made it into our best of the year podcast, you know, one way or another. You know, cats, they always find a way. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just a Sad. thing. It's, that's where we're at. <laughs> Max, what's the first movie you want to talk about? Um, I would like to talk about Queen and Slim, actually. Heck uh, yeah. On. The late... Late release. Uh, it's directed by Melina Matsukas, mm-hmm. who I think this is her directorial debut. This is her feature, feature debut. debut. But she's done a lot. She did a lot of music videos with Beyonce and, yeah. and stuff. And I didn't even realize she did the formation video until after the word. But it stars uh, Daniel Kaluuya mm-hmm. of uh, Jordan Peele fame and Jodie Turner Smith, and they turn in some amazing performances. I uh, was convinced by my boyfriend. He really wanted to see it, and I was like, I have a feeling I'm going to leave this feeling bad, and I have a hard time signing up for that. And also, the trailer didn't lend much to it, and but I was so surprised, and it really stuck with me after the fact. It's just... 
everything about it. The acting in it is phenomenal. It's sad that it, it's, again, one of these things that just kind of has gone under the radar. Things have been louder than it. Uh, yeah, the way it just all unfurls, I feel like these two people are like living there every day and every minute like it's their last in a way that we haven't seen it in since. I mean, it's going to draw a lot of comparisons, I think, to Bonnie and Clyde and oh, yeah. Thelma and Louise. And, you know, for every bit of sexiness it is, it has a lot of truth that hurts a little bit. Um, and it just sat with me days, weeks after the fact. I was just, I'm still thinking about it. And it's beautiful. And that was one of the directors... Uh, I was talking about, I'm just, I'm like, okay, you have my attention. I'm ready to see what you do next. Lena Waite uh, did the writing. Yeah. And, yeah, I, I, I have only good things to say. I'm just like, I hope everyone goes and see it. If you have a chance, watch this movie. It is it is good. It will break your heart. But uh, I think it's, uh, it's so measured. And also, I think the, the director really paints the American South in a, in a way... That is both hideous and beautiful. There's long sweeping shots of like the Florida Keys and parts of the South and that you just you see in movies, but they don't treat it like she treats it like it's something to actually look at. And I think there is that eye of like, wow, there is a lot of beauty around here, but just as much beauty as there is in the trees and the swamp and the bay and the people. There's also terrible, awful gas station white gas station attendants who will really puts you on edge and it makes you nervous and it was yeah it, it really stuck with me I love it I would say go see it <laughs> I haven't seen it yet but I, I, I think you saw it right Mo? I did see what, it what did you think I loved it too it's it's in my top 10 it didn't make the cut to the top 3 but it's it is really great like you said, phenomenal cast. I also want to give a shout out to Bokeem Woodbine. Oh yeah, because I saw him in season two of Fargo. He's great in that. He shows up here and he's so That's good. Where I saw him, I was like, why does he look so familiar? I want him to be in more stuff because he's so, like he's got this such such this unique energy to him where it's this laid back charm that's really like effortless but really captivating and intense <laughs> and intense like he's so he, it's there's there's so few performers that like you can you can nail down that energy like that um that one it's it's so much it, it's it, I, and, I, and I'm also like fast like there's the one of my fi- one of my favorite little scenes in there just this this one moment where um they uh they, they stop by a gas station there's some people who recognize them and they're like you guys caused a lot of trouble because what what you did it's it, now everyone is cracking down on, on black people across the nation you should have just taken the ticket and it's like that's another perspective it is and it's where's and it doesn't demonize it. It doesn't. The, the movie doesn't paint this character as like some some misanthrope or someone wrong. And it's it's like where what what decisions do you make? What battles do you fight? Because these are people who don't have the luxury of they facing every injustice as we see in the movie. Um, so it's it's that that sort of those smarts are it's. It's very appreciated to see that that kind of that perspective of it. That's um, a really interesting idea, too. Like, like so many movies take place almost like solely inside one character's perspective. Yeah, and like to step outside that, I mean, that's something really fascinating. Absolutely, I, there's a lot of and there's just a lot of choices that make you, I think, feel I mean, conflicted. It's, I think that sometimes you're like, I mean, I think you're rooting for these characters at all times. Oh yeah, because. It's the circumstances that have brought them here. It doesn't feel right for them to lose. But at the same time, yeah, that was a really nice moment. Because that was pretty far in, and at that point we'd had lots of people who had recognized them, but were offering them safety or shelter or just, like, the ability to look away and not notice who they are. Uh, And this was one character who was like, I don't respect your decisions. But he is also still fully aware of the situation he was like I'm gonna help you but it's also gonna cost you money and I think and it, yeah you're right it's just there is a lot of things in there that I don't think there are a lot of easy answers to what's happening like you can't be like oh well this person is obviously on the wrong and you're like like this person I think there's a lot of gray area that this operates in and because there's some stuff that happens from people who we identify as good people who 
don't make decisions that are necessarily right and morally justified. Yeah. Um, so it's it, it plays with your expectations like that. Um, it's so, it's so good. Go see. Also, I. <laughs> See it with a black audience if you can, because that's what I was lucky enough to do. That I did not get to see Black Panther with a predominantly black audience because this is Portland. <laughs> but I did get to. They, they had a screening of it, and like it was the first half of the of, of people who showed up were like uh, this. The, I think it was just just this all black book club who all got passes to see it, uh. and it's it's. It's I, I love seeing the reactions of it. I love being in a theater like that where it's where people are, are where there's that give and take with the screen and the audience. Sure, I live for that stuff. I did I, I did actually get to, but I think it's only because I waited so long. It was only playing in one theater, and I so I think if you live in Southeast Portland, it's like if you want to see Queen and Slim, you're going to this theater that's playing it three times a day. And we caught a really late showing, but I I you you know I did remember it was just the beginning, the opening scene with the. The, the police officer when they first get pulled over I mean there's tension in the room and oh, as yeah. much as I feel like I could feel it I had to recognize I was like the feeling some people are feeling a lot more tension and that's and I think that's I think that movie brings it up and I think if, if it can generate that feeling amongst I mean everyone who maybe don't have that feeling is yeah. I think it's good that's why when we were talking about like what movies are we most anxious to talk about I was like mm. I'm not entirely sure if this is my number three movie of the year but I definitely want to talk about it sure because I do think it's worth seeing and I was I was really blown away and I was very apprehensive to see it because I, I just have a hard time signing up for movies that I know will make me feel bad <laughs> well I have a movie that I'm anxious to talk about yeah what's your number what two well it, it, it's a movie that took me back to an old Film comment article, 2013, right when uh, American Hustle, the Wolf of Wall Street, were in theaters, mm-hmm. and the article said, uh, you "May be surprised that there are two Martin Scorsese comedies in theaters, albeit only one directed by Scorsese himself." Well, we now have a similar situation this year. We have two Scorsese crime movies that came out, except uh, only one, The Irishman, was directed by Scorsese. The other were the other one was Scorsese in. And I have to say, I think like with uh, American Hustle Scorsese. being, in my opinion, better than The Wolf of Wall Street, I think uh, American Hustlers is a far better oh, movie. Oh, thank God. I was worried you were going to say... Hustlers, yeah. Hustlers? I, was, I was worried you were going to say Joker, and I was going to get real... <laughs> oh. Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, uh, Hustlers. Hustlers, yes. What? Hustlers. Heck yes. Uh, yes. No. Uh, no. movie? Yes. I haven't watched it. I just Oh, well, then you can't suck, man. That's what I'm saying. Is like I keep hearing good things about this and I just it, again, this is one of those movies that I'm like, okay. Like it's like she got a lot of praise for getting her body in shape, but I that was like about it. Now I'm like hearing Oscar talk for J Lo and I was like, Really? Well here's Did I miss something? Here's what I love about Hustlers. I mean for uh, those of our lovely listeners who don't know, it's based on a true story. It's about a group of strippers who, in the wake of the financial crisis, to make money, they uh, come up with this elaborate scam where, you know, at night they will seduce, you know, wealthy-ish guys, you know, get them drunk, drug them, use their credit cards to steal, you know, huge, huge bunches of money. And then the idea is that, you know, those guys complain the next day, like, it was at a strip club and someone drugged me and stole my money. Well, it's not exactly a very compelling story. <laughs> um, uh, but that's not what I love about it. What I love about it is uh, there are so many, you know, crime movies about sort of the the bonds of brotherhood between, you know, clever and dangerous men. Mm. We don't usually get to see that with a group of women. And it's, uh, you know, even though the, the threat of the patriarchy is, is very present in Hustlers, as arguably the villain of uh, the movie, it's, it's, so, uh, it's so focused on the women and their, their friendships. And that it reminds me of a, a piece A.O. Scott wrote where he talked about, uh, you know, the, the dynamic that Jennifer Lopez and, as the ringleader and uh, Constance Wu as her protege have... It's kind of like the the classic thing where, like the you know, in, often in male dominated movies, you have the kind of uh, the older and uh, magnetic, but also kind of dubious mentor who, who schools you know this this younger you know kind of uh, 
sort of easily manipulated character who gradually becomes disillusioned. And it was so powerful to uh, to see that dynamic between two women and two absolutely brilliant actresses, but also to um uh, to you know kind of to see been done with that level of complexity. I don't see this as a comeback for Jennifer Lopez. I think she's great in whatever she does. I see it more as like, this is the first film, maybe in a while, that's worthy of her immense talent and allows her to play this character who is kind of a motherly figure to this group of young women and is, you know, kind of nurturing them and guiding them. But at the same time, you know, and, and, and that's, that's genuine. You know, her love for them is genuine. But then, you know, she is also a criminal. She also makes... You know, it's a business. It's a business, yeah. And, and the, the, the conflict that breaks out within the group, you know, really speaks to that kind of the, the tragedy of everything splitting apart. And, the, and then also, I just... I love... I love the images in the movie. It's it's visually, I think, one of the most potent films of the year. Like, just there's a great shot at the end where um, uh, J Lo goes to the ATM, and the camera like follows her from behind with the big uh, juicy logo on her back. And then, like, as soon as she gets the money out, like the cops come for her, and like turns up, and she like raises her hand. She's holding a dollar bill, and she lets it go, and just flies away into the wind. And it's like, wow, like that's. That's the whole movie in that one magnificent, iconic image. I'm sorry for those of you who I just spoiled the movie for, but but come on, it's a true story. What do you I expect? I mean, <laughs> I, how about this? You convinced me to watch Hustlers, which is something I didn't think anyone could do. <laughs> really? I didn't. It didn't sound like. What the I mean, heck, man? I love Lizzo. For real? For real? I don't know. It just wasn't a story. It was like, yeah, I want to see that play out, and I love Constance Wu. Uh, I will say, I do have a grudge against J Lo. I've never. I've never loved J Lo. Uh, I think she's a brilliant. I've never loved J Lo. I, I think she's a brilliant. I think again, and that's and this is the thing is I didn't hear anybody really singing a lot of praises when it came out. Nobody was like, "Go see Hustlers." I heard people really enjoyed Hustlers. You and I were listening to very different people, <laughs> apparently. And so, well, I was also going through. I I think that was when I was moving. It was when it right around when it came out. Was it September? September. I don't know when you were moving. I mean, yeah, that was a very busy time of my life. I don't life. know your life, man. You don't know my life. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I heard that J Lo did a strip tease to a Fiona Apple song, and I was like, I'm the, for that. That's an amazing sequence. And that's like, I'm, I'm, I, that sounds like someone who, like, a fucking gross film bro is trying to justify <laughs> enjoying a scene that's a, a, a strip tease. But like, no, I heard it. Was, I, that's one of the things people really talk about well, is how good it is. Like that, for Sars, I'm pretty sure that is her dancing throughout the whole thing. Oh, it is. It is. It's, it's yeah. really well shot with just all the different angles, the neon lights, just the scene, the bid where just like she shows up and all the money just starts, just flies into yeah. the air. <laughs> it's okay. How about well, this? And here's, again? Here's, I, here's, here's, I mean, another thing that this, this brings up is like you know, this was, um, uh, this movie was directed by Lorene Scafaria. And one thing that I, I think, and she directed, wrote, wrote, written and directed. One thing I think she did brilliantly is, you know, I mean. You know, you're shooting, you know, scantily clad women, you know, doing these very sexy dances, but uh, she does it in such a way where you're, um, uh, you, you know, in, instead of viewing it in terms of like, yeah, man, bring it's it on. It's not titillation. It's not, it's not titillation at all. You're, you're watching and you're, what you're focused on is the, uh, the craft and the athleticism. Yeah. And also just like kind of the... Uh, the fascinating thing that J-Lo pulls off so well is like, you know, being this character who can mesmerize a whole room, who can, you know, move in such a way and work the crowd in such a way where you go, oh yeah, I want to give her my money. Mm-hmm. And the art of that and the manipulation of that, and I think it's uh, Which is really powerful to I watch. I mean, there, I've known plenty of strippers to know that it's not as easy as just like showing up and taking your clothes off. It's there's there is more to it than that, and we live in a city that's very sex positive that really treats some stripping as an art form. Yeah, you just and you can see it shows when you go to some where there's like some woman climbing up to the top of the pole, spinning around down on her thighs, and you're just like, how? <laughs> like this woman is like, I think she could beat me up. I think she could actually do some serious damage to me, and 
and I, I was like, I'm afraid of her in a great way, and it's and it's a real art. So I promise I will watch Hustlers. I promise. Mm, That's good enough for me. <laughs> you go, you convinced me. What's the next movie you want to talk about? Next movie I want to talk about. I'm not. I'm not going to get too deep into this one because I feel like uh, it will come up again. But that movie is Parasite. Um, I mean, I'd be willing to talk about it. We don't. We could all discuss it. It's my number one, but I wouldn't mind discussing it in tandem so we don't have to retread some things. Spoiler alert. Uh, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to admit where things fall. <laughs> Alright, let's let's do it. Um, yeah, Parasite is my number two feature uh, pick of the year. Uh, uh, directed and co-written by Bong Joon-ho and starring various Korean actors whose names I do not know. Um... But yeah, it's it's Max is getting on his phone. I'm help. I'm trying to help where I can. We're, you keep going. We're professionals. We do things. We prepare ahead of time. Um, but yeah, it's just it's. I knew very little about what this movie was when I was going in, and I just sat just sat down. It's like is because the trailer makes it look like kind of a creepy movie, but also I. Uh, it's just like what is this? What's going on? And then. You get there, and it's it's kind of funny. Like it's this weird, like black comedy, and it's you don't know how to feel. And then we hit the halfway point, and shit gets weird. <laughs> um, I won't give away the details. Um, but yeah, it's it's just I had no idea where this movie was going. And then looking back on it, knowing what the answer is, it's oh, this is the only way it could have gone. <laughs> like looking at that one midpoint scene. And just like, where do we go from here? Because it feels like something has... There, we've reached the, the point of no return. Where do we go from here? And then, I didn't expect that specifically, but also like, oh, this is the only way it could have happened because this is the message of the story. It's very, very upfront about how it view, about class disparity, about the this sort of... I, I, don't, I hesitate to, see, to use the obvious word, but parasitic relationship between the haves and the haves not, not. This this thing where criminality and duplicity is is sort of necessary in order to survive, um, and just that that people are completely unaware of it, of, of or willing, willingly ignorant of these differences. Um, it's just it's a really weird ride of a movie but it works super well do you you know um, do you see a connection between it and us as well because they're they're not only they're both dealing with with class mm-hmm. and class disparity as a main theme but they both have this uh, this visual metaphor of the the oppressed class you know being like almost being literally beneath the upper class and literally then some underground rising up yeah. yeah and it's and just the duality between the two families the fact that there's for each one there for each one of the of the main family there is an opposite to some degree that they directly interact with um, there's the dad driving around the other dad there's the, sure. the the son tutoring the daughter and and all this stuff it's there's there's a connection certainly there's a there there are links to be made they they pair up well um I think the difference is that uh, Parasite arrives at a much stronger, weaker finale. Bleak is one of the emotions that I have trouble dealing with in movies, unless it feels... Like, I, I can I can deal with... I, there's well, It's a quote from, like, Guy Fieri or something, but it's like, I can go deal with any pain as long as there's meaning to it. Or yeah. something like that. I don't know. I've only seen, like, GIFs of it on Tumblr. <laughs> but, um, but it's... I... Parasite has that tragic ending to it that's so well done and so powerful and just an absolute gut punch. Um, it's it's phenomenal. It's really a great movie, and I'm so glad it's getting a lot of attention because usually a lot of like uh, uh, foreign features don't do that in the American market, but this one it's it's made an impression. I'll save I'll save some of what I have to say for what Max talks about but the one thing that was really interesting to me was that you know how as as you were just alluding to it has had like a, a real appeal to people who I don't think normally would go see a foreign language film and uh, or in, or an international film as the academies we're gonna yeah. call them now but, but it's like it seems like it kind of a uh, you know, is like I know I know Bong Joon Ho said like this is a movie that you know 
it would be really hard to fully understand like outside of South Korea. And I and I see I see what he means because you know it's it's so rooted in um, uh, in time and place. On the other hand, you know. I think I think it, it would be impossible to find a country that didn't have a version of that story oh, sure. playing out yeah. in in the news in people's lives. Yeah, it's there, there's I, I brought up this quote before, but there's a line in um there there was an interview that uh, Robert Rodriguez did with Chris Hardwick on the Nerds podcast. And he was our, he, when he was making Spy Kids, he had to convince the studios to back a movie with a Hispanic leading ca- Hispanic cast. Um, you know, Antonio Banderas was a star at the time, but not, no. not a lot of other people. And the no. way he sold it was the, way, the more specific you make something, the more universal it becomes. You don't have to be British to appreciate James Bond but you know him as a character through this specificity, even if it's not specific related to you. Um, and that's the sense I get from Parasite, is that these sort of, this specificity of, you know, living in the uh, slums of, I think, I assume Seoul, South Korea. Uh, I don't know if they say specifically where, I just assume that because it's like the largest city and the capital. Um, but just life there of just like, these guys who uh, who try to make a living stacking, uh, folding pizza boxes, um, and 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 ju- it's just like I I don't I I haven't experienced that specific job, but I get that that's sort of like the gig economy, uh, barely scraping by kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, I was trying to find the answer where it takes place. It was not on the MDB page. All right, I'm going to look it up on Wikipedia. You start talking about it. We, we all have our version of um, uh, folding pizza boxes. Mine was scooping cream cheese into little plastic containers and always getting well, <laughs> always taking a UFO. <laughs> I mean, and it's. I think there's comments made from the richer part of the family that di- directly correlate with that, like that that man works so hard. He works yep. so hard that he to just survive. Yep. And I think someone comments on the smell. Yep. And like there's this weird disdain that grows from like the man who works so little to have a bunch of money and this man who works himself to the point of stinking. Yeah. And can't rise above shit, literally. And it's a uh, there's yeah, I, I love Parasite. Uh, I, Wait, does uh, it are you going to talk about that at the end? Oh no, I'll talk about it right now. Oh, you're talking about I, it now. I, I okay. feel like okay. so that way we don't have We're to re- gonna, we don't have to retread. This, this will be the parasite movie. block. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's. I mean, I don't know if it's on Ben's list because he hasn't revealed that, but I definitely have revealed it to everyone. It's my number one movie of the year. It was the easiest part of the list. Generally, generally, I can always pick the one movie that I know is like like the one that's the most obvious. Always ends up on the top of my list. Uh, I love Parasite. Uh, just from a writing standpoint, I feel like for a while I felt like I knew where the story was going. I had a feeling, uh, and going into this, no, you fucking didn't. And yeah, and then it was like <laughs> wrong. No, you didn't. And then it was like, wait, kind of you did. And you're just like, wait, what? What's it? like, like the amount of chaos this movie generates in like I think 20 minutes, like where you think this movie is and what this movie is becomes something completely different in 20 minutes. And all of a sudden, it's like you don't even have time to strap in for this ride because now it's going, and you just ride it out to the end, and it is bleak. I think the trailer I saw was one of the first ones that was trying its hardest to reveal absolutely nothing. But given my experience with uh, Korean horror films, it felt like a Korean horror film trailer. So going into it, I think that's I would love people to know as little about this movie as possible going into it because I think it really benefits. Yeah. So I. I think this is one of the most secretive. I think people. I love that we did a Star Wars podcast. We're like, all right, by the way, here's some spoilers right up front. I'm very cautious about this movie because I felt that is what really helped affect my opinion of this movie. Was sure. I thought, okay, a horror movie generally with like the scariest thing, like in foreign language horror films, is generally either a monster or a monstrous person. And so, in some part of me was kind of expecting that in this, and it's more of a drama. It's no a, one is as monstrous as you want them to be. It's not that cut and dry. Exactly. Sure. Uh, and that is kind of like, 
everyone is yeah it's, well, it's, it's really not it's not scary it's, it's very sad bleak is oh no <laughs> bleak is Most the right spell. in case you're wondering what that sound was <laughs> it's, we're all fine huh? it's it's everyone's kind of a shitty person but like in this really understandable way it's like well, yeah, in, if I was in those circumstances, I would probably be the same way. There's the line where they're like, these people are rich, they can afford to be nice. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, eh? yeah, they ain't wrong. Yeah. Well, and also, too, I feel like the movie, you know, while having compassion across the board is, you know, really unsparing and showing just, like, how decadent and callous the wealthy families can be. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and also, Not malicious, like, but... Short sighted. Yes, yeah, yeah, and how destructive that. I mean, yeah, I think it's, it definitely paints a very stark picture of class. And yes. What, yeah, like, like most said, like, you know, they can afford to be nice. It's like there are some shitty situations where it's like I have to just tell people, no, I can't, because it's like I don't have the, uh, uh, I can't afford to be that nice. Sometimes. Right. And it really sucks. It doesn't make. Doesn't make me feel good, but uh, yeah, I would just say I was like, I think this movie has spoken to a large. I love, like, I saw it and I was like, you know, this is probably the best movie of the year, and I don't, I wouldn't be surprised if it gets completely overlooked. And I've been so pleased to see it not only not overlooked, but it seems to be gaining momentum. And I think that's oh, I think so great. Yeah. Bong Joon Ho has been working for years. He did The Host. He did Okja. He did uh, Snowpiercer, Snowpiercer. Which I saw, and I should see... I, now I want to see it again. Yeah. I he think, also made the other movie called Mother. Oh, yeah. Did he? The non-Aronofsky okay. Mother. And <laughs> I think they're... Mother without the exclamation. Mother, mother without the exclamation. Just and also mother. with an uppercase M. Oh. <laughs> Grammar's but, important. Grammar's but I important. think... So that's why I'm like, you know, I really think... I was like, I'm very happy to see it going places. It was like, but I'll keep talking about it. I have yet to see something that just from start to finish just took so much from me. And again, just like Queen and Slim, it has sat with me and it has like made its mark for the rest of the year. But it isn't so depressing. And this is what I love about it. It isn't so depressing. I won't watch it again. Although when it first came out, I was convinced I would never watch this movie again. <laughs> it's beautiful to look at. He put paints this these beautiful portraits against just the shittiest circumstances and he's he's a craftsman and he's been working towards this and it's nice to see him getting this and I would really love to see him just go all the way and I really hope he does but uh if you can't have that, he'll have my he'll have the award in my book. This is the best movie of the year for me. I uh, I, I can see it getting foreign language feature. Oh, it'll, it'll, that, it'll that, easily no grab that, that one. Yeah, I, yeah. I think it I think it deserves more than that, and that's that's why I think it'll it'll get shut out. I think we'll, I'll be happy to see Bong Joon Ho get the director nomination. I would really love to see that, and uh, if if more, I would love I would love for her to have all the awards. But you know, I'm also I have to keep realistic, and but I love this movie, and uh, yeah, I will say as little as I can about it. Just go see it. Mm. I, I was impressed by this movie as well. I I, I do want to have one criticism that I want to bring up, and that's the uh, like personally, I don't like the second half nearly as much as I like the first half, and the reason for that is that. I felt like the, the the beginning is so through the the roof inventive, and, and not just like exploring like kind of a, you know, clashes between different social classes, but just like exploring the idea of of wealth almost as an illusion. Yeah. Like the the fact that the the father of the impoverished family, you know, the, the idea of him him going to a a car dealership, I think it was like a Mercedes dealership or something. And like, kind of, you know, pretending he's shopping for a car, you know, learning how to drive a really expensive car so he can effectively be, uh, you know, pretend to be like sort of an upper crust driver for the wealthy family. Just details like that, I thought were so funny and chilling and and, and fascinating. And it would, I, I you know, while I, I I do think the the finale is very good, it was a little disappointed me to see like after, to see it kind of descend into you know kind of horror and violence Madness. and murder and it wasn't that that I didn't believe that was a logical outcome for the situation <laughs> I, I absolutely did you know and I, I believe that's that was you know a legitimate maybe maybe even you know given what he was trying to say the best path to take but just like in, in terms of like you know 
wanting to be like maybe a bit more surprised you know like I, I almost like I almost wish like something even crazier had happened like oh god I like there's like you know like there's the scene like where the 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 son of the the poor family is, is saying like you know like oh you know maybe I'll marry the the daughter you know this wealthy man and they're like well then someone else will have to pretend to be your parents it's like it's got my mind is filled with those possibilities like like what if that actually happened you know like what if they took it to a really you know a really truly went to story. that logical extreme I, yeah I think, yeah I'd be really I'd just be really curious to see an alternate universe version of this movie where you go down a really wild path. I I don't know I kind of love how I feel like they're like I said I, I when I'm picking movies I do pick on a comfort level and that's why again I have a hard time watching documentaries because a good documentary is generally talking about something that doesn't necessarily make you feel good because sure. it wants Absolutely. to inspire change yeah. in you and so it's it's, and, it's it's mission depends on your discomfort kind basically. of exactly and uh, and I think in that way I was when I went and saw Parasite I was not having the best day and agreeing to see it was under like the, the idea of like oh, I'm going to see a Korean horror film which will disturb me probably it'll scare me but then when I wound up in this I was like okay I think I know where we're going oh I see like I kind of couldn't really predict what was happening next but you know you usually guess and it throws in such a wild card in that middle. I totally know what you mean. Like, I feel like we explore some ideas in the beginning that, but I was like, just like Mo said too, it's like, you reach this point, you're like, I can't anticipate what's going to happen next because it's all coming so fast. You're just kind of swept up in the current of it all. You can't predict what's going to happen. And then you get to the end and you're like, I don't like where this is going. I don't like this ending. And But you also realize, you're like, where where else could we have gone? Like, you can't, like, you can't rewrite the story into a nice, beautiful, happy fairy tale ending. And in a weird way, it's... It's what it is. It's what it's going to be, and you just have to just be like, "Here it is." And that's, I kind of love that there is there is so much chaos. Like I couldn't even prepare to be ready for that ending, and it's very rare a movie can keep me that unstable. And that's part of why I was so depressed after. And I was just like, it kept taking. It just so I hit my zero, and it just kept taking. It left me at a deficit. I just need dessert, and I felt like I could cry for an hour and just not stop. And that's what I was like. And the fact that I'm still like. Let's do that again. <laughs> I, like, I think really just speaks to the tale that's that's unwoven, and I think I'm I'm ready for that. I, I'd be more excited to now that I know what's going to happen to sure. view it through that lens, just kind of like us. Like, does it mean something different this next time around? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of questions I had going into it, and I feel like none of those questions mattered after an hour. Like, yeah, I was like, okay. One, well, you know, one one thing I think it's powerful about the movie is it really. I, I think, oddly enough, in modern movies, suspense is kind of an underutilized tool. You know, we, we, we get a lot of movies that try to wow us and excite us, but to actually, like, like make us, you know, or, or scare us, but, like, to actually make us feel tension, you know, make us afraid. feel in suspense, make us feel afraid, For it's actually rare reasons. to see a movie that does that so effectively. And the, the scene where, you know, the main characters are, you know, under the table in a rainstorm, you know, while just feet from them, the wealthy couple is there, you know, having sex. I mean, it's just stuff like that. It's like you you feel the, the closeness and the threat so intensely. Mm-hmm. That's I, a powerful thing. I saw it too, and I mean, it's easier to explain away you know, killer clowns, because there's no killer clowns, <laughs> and you're more than likely not going to get dragged into a sewer by a clown. It's, he paints... Well, that happened to me a couple times. Yeah, I mean, that no, one time. Not, not, but, not for a couple months. No, but Palm Springs, am I right? And but, that was the last time I drank tequila. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I think there is the, the story that is told in a way that you can, even though you're not an impoverished person living in Korea, like, in this situation... You're fully aware of really, like... Well, I think at, at that point you're just specifically talking about, I feel like you would know... Ex- like, you feel that that fear of... You know what it would be like to be discovered somewhere you shouldn't be. It yes. preys on a different fear that we can relate to in a different way. But then on top of that, you're even, like... I felt like even, like, the fear was more real because at least it's like, oh, if I get caught, like, this is what could happen. But given what just happened right before that, it's not even just the fear of being caught, it's the fear of everything else that is now just like 
falling down and you just, yeah, it's hard to just sit there. It's easier to imagine that fear. It's scarier because it's real. <laughs> so the next movie I'm going to talk about continues a grand tradition of me uh, hating a lot of uh, Oscar hopeful movies and, and loving at least a couple of them. Uh, movies that are seen as kind of award season misfires. It's Motherless Brooklyn. Oh, I thought you were going to say Cats. I really did. I was like, no, but Yeah, it's the movie that will not die. The movie that keeps rearing its furry head into the Despite losing, again, $70 million. They really thought that was going to work out. They did. That's hilarious. And sad. It's real bad. It's it's not cool to lose that much unless you're Boy Boy in 2049 and you're Denis Villeneuve and you're artsy. Uh, Uh, Losing a million dollars isn't cool. You know what is cool? Losing a a billion dollars. (laughs) <laughs> Facebook movie. Oh All right, God. Motherless Brooklyn. Motherless Brooklyn. Okay. So, for those who don't know, Motherless Brooklyn is uh, based on a novel by John Lethem, uh, although it actually has almost nothing uh, in common with the novel. It uh, basically just takes the main character and puts him in a new story, moves the action from the 90s to the 1950s, and uh, the new story focuses on a private detective named Wine played by Edward Norton, uh, who uh, also directs and writes, if I didn't mention that already. His mentor is this uh, this older, seasoned uh, detective played by Bruce Willis, and the film begins with uh, Bruce Willis being killed and the Norton character having to unravel the mystery of what happened and why, which is uh, made difficult by the fact that he has Tourette's syndrome, and so he has to journey into this labyrinth of uh, you know conspiratorial doings in New York City, while you know trying to interrogate people, trying to you know masquerade as multiple characters to you know kind of or uh, to kind of weasel information out, or, uh, or mostly just this uh, this Sniff one out. journalist character he plays, and uh, uh, but while at the same time having these you know constant outbursts where you know he'll you know through no fault of his own, you know, you know, say inappropriate or awkward things, you know, in the middle of a conversation. And the reason I love it is it's because it's like kind of a an unabashedly idealistic romantic movie. It's a it's a movie that, that really really sells the idea that one loner walking the mean streets, you know, in a pico in a fedora with a heart of gold can truly uh, truly bring about justice and the the great thing is it pits him against a a wonderful villain a character named Moses Randolph played by Alec Baldwin who is a Robert Moses like power broker who is a racist and a sexual predator who is uh, literally allowed to get away with murder because he, uh, he he takes care of the city's parks and so he's seen as this uh, this nice angelic figure and yet he's he's doing these absolutely atrocious things and uh, the movie builds to this really remarkable scene at a swimming pool where uh, Edward Norton and Alec Baldwin are just having this conversation and where you you get a really kind of a astonishingly believable glimpse of evil in a movie. You know, because, uh, I mean, Alec Baldwin, of course, plays Trump on SNL, and, and his character in Motherless Brooklyn is very Trump-like, but the SNL character is a cartoon. This is the real thing, the real horror of that kind of, you know, deranged uh, American tyrant. And uh, it's, I, I'll never forget just the way he lays it out to Norton, saying, you know, all these horrible things, I do them because I want to, you know. There's no explanation, there's no unhappy childhood. His uh, explanation is just, I want to do these things, and I have the power to do it. And I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, the movie is, uh, you know, definitely, I think it's naive in its belief that, like, this kind of, you know, noble, you know, upright figure like Edward Norton's character can stick it to a guy like that. You know, the world typically does not work that way. But I also think that, uh, you know, we need sort of idealistic myths about, you know, right and wrong and like, you know, kind of a, a, a set of, you know, 
principles triumphing over a person like that and uh, you know that's why I find the movie to be you know an escapist effective you know fantasy yes about you know a guy asking the right questions and you know not giving up until you know he sees justice done but also you know a, a moving a moving story about good triumphing over evil so that's my pitch for Motherless Purple. I wow, liked it a lot. Cool. I, uh, it's, I'll have to check it out. I've heard its title being thrown around a lot. But, I saw uh, I saw the trailer for it. Um, I was a little turned off by the notion by Edward Norton playing a guy with Tourette's, just because like someone playing like playing someone with a neurological disease like that or an affliction. Like, I don't know what the proper terminology is. Yeah. But someone playing someone with an affliction like that just always feels a little mm, to me. Um, but I that's that's a that's a solid pitch. I I would I would be interested to see what what happens with that. And I'm 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 a sucker for a good you know good versus evil story. Oh, me too. I, I'll appreciate I appreciate complexity. You know, I, we just got done talking about Parasite. I appreciate you know it 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 lives in a very gray area, definitely. But you know what? I'll go I'll I'll go in for good triumphing over evil. There's there's something to that. Well, and also I, I know all three of us here are big fans of Knives Out. Yes, which is a uh, I think also one of the best films of the year. And Motherless Brooklyn and uh, Knives Out, I feel like they share uh, an interesting kind of common strength. Where where Knives Out was was Ryan Johnson kind of taking this fantastical character, the gentleman sleuth, and saying, "What if we could drop that character in to today and you know deal with uh, you know do deal with you know uh, a kind of." bigotry that's that's very pertinent right now and have that you know kind of fictional character help, help try to right these real world wrongs Motherless Brooklyn I think does a, a, a kind of similar thing in a in a more leisurely fashion you know Knives Out is kind of a it's a it's, it's a little it's a, it's a little it's a little more more spry you're kind of zigzagging through time you know and all these different flashbacks Motherless Brooklyn is more like the kind of the the sort of the, the long, methodical, you know, mostly in chronological order uh, version of that. And I think they're both great films. I highly recommend, both, recommend them both to anyone who, you know, is looking for, like, a good... You know, everyone says mid-range movies are dead. You know, these are both great mid-range movies. <laughs> I would absolutely recommend. Or, or mid, mid-budget, mid not, not indie, okay. not blockbuster, to God. clarify. And... With that, I think I'll turn it over to Mo. What is your final pick? My final pick, my number one favorite movie of the year. Um, we, we just got done talking about a movie about a good triumphing over evil. There's The movie I picked is my number one that has stuck with me, that has brought me so much joy and so much so much glee. It's a movie where someone literally says, love is the most powerful force in the world. And that movie is Jojo Rabbit. Um, Love Jojo Rabbit. Written, directed, and co-starring Taika Waititi, um, based on the book uh, *Caging Skies*, I believe it is. Um, it's it, it, the premise just sounds very tacky. Of just like we're kind of going to do kind of like this this Disney movie about a precocious youngster and his kooky imaginary friend, but his kooky imaginary friend is. Hitler. Wait, which Hitler? Oh, Adolf Hitler. Yeah, yeah. that's a bad one. <laughs> no, not, not, not Bradley Hitler Smith. <laughs> the, the, there's the elevator pitch for you. The, the former co star of Horsin' Around. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I, that's a deep cut. That was like nice Bojack Horseman reference. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's, that was, that was. Sorry. But yeah, uh, it's, and it's like, that's. That feels re- like it could be really tacky, but it's coming from a place of a you know Taika Waititi being uh, this kooky weirdo, but also someone who is way really smart in terms of how he tells stories and what kind of stories he wants to tell, um, and also someone who is both Polynesian and Jewish, um, who has that that backstory going on and knows. The value that satire, that that uh, uh, mockery has in t- in in these kind of stories, you know, um, we we are definitely living in an age where um, I won't say that white supremacy is bad, but it's definitely more public. 
Sure. Um, that, was some, that was a quote someone pointed out, you know, is as soon as people started carrying, fo- carrying cameras around in their pockets, people saying, I saw Bigfoot went way down, and people saying, I saw the police shoot a nigga, that went way up. And so it, it's... It's it's good to know it, it's there's a lot of media now with, about like white supremacy and white nationalism definitely that makes them out as these like monolithic evil figures and I'm not gonna deny that there's some do that but they're also fucking ridiculous yes. <laughs> like the, that was my favorite one of my favorite things about Jojo Rabbit is that like his mission is to kind of find out about is is to covertly quote unquote find out about the secret lives of the Jewish people and like what weird stuff they come up with. And he believes every lie he told that is told to him, and it's completely fucking ridiculous. And it's like, oh, lies these, you shouldn't believe. Like, but they, they have horns. That they have horns. That they sleep upside down like, like bats. That. <laughs> like all this stuff. But it's just, it's the fact that there are people who believe this, if not necessarily this ridiculous crap, but stuff like it because that helps their agenda because that helps them that's they need to cling to that it's important to remember and also something else I appreciate about it is it doesn't shy away from the horrors because yes these people are ridiculous but they're also dangerous but they also destroy lives they kill people they overturn governments it's all this nightmare stuff that doesn't get swept away and it's still funny, and it's still heartwarming, and it's this insane roller coaster ride of emotions, but it all holds together so well. And I, I walked away with that, and it just it grew on me. Like I liked it at first, and then it's just like, no, this is this really works. This is re- a really smart way to do this. Like my, uh, satires. And, and parody, those are things that I, I have a lot of love for. And I love it when they get done well. And this is an example of that. Uh, so, definitely, Jojo Rabbit, that's my number one. Uh, well, let, me, let me ask you something. I, I, like, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen the movie yet. I'm certainly going to see it before the Oscar nominations come out so I can speak about it then. Because I imagine it's going gonna, it's gonna to get nominated for a few trophies, perhaps win a few big ones as well. Yeah. But um, I, I have I've certainly been aware of the 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 fact that you know like on the one hand it's one of the most beloved films of the year won the audience award at TIFF you know very likely going to get a best picture nomination it is also fairly divisive yeah and uh, the one at least one criticism I've heard is that you know the movie uh, is, is almost too easy on the Nazis and, you know, kind of has this perspective of, like, oh, maybe they, uh, you know, they they just, you know, need to be shown some compassion and, you know, like, some people feel that that's a, that's a bit of a, a weak message or unrealistic, but, I mean, given I what you that. just said, I imagine, I imagine you disagree with that and I just, I, I just wanted to give you the chance to, like, kind of, like, re- respond to, you know, those... Those kinds of that kind of discourse, however, yeah. You so a lot of that definitely go- revolves around uh, the character of Captain Klinsendorf, uh, who's played by Sam Rockwell, and he's there's more to him than meets the eye, and he's more complex than the rest of the characters, and he's still very much a Nazi. He's still a patriot for the German army, but in a way that's different than the others, and because of that sort of nuance that he's not part of this monolithic evil it's sort of it's it 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 can come across like there is more complexity to a hate group than just playing this uh than the loudest members exactly and the difference is with jojo rabbit it never it never apologizes Mm -hmm. for him it never states that he is that the things he do, he does, the things he fights for are justified. Um, more than anything else, it just he's trapped, and there's some tragedy to that. But also, it is a trap of his own making, and it's something that he's he has done this to himself. Um, and the other is the other character is Jojo himself, and Jojo is 
a child, and it's it seems easier to sway him to the right side to, to win him over because he's sure. a kid, he views everything through this lens of of being ten years old and not knowing any better. And I mean, I think I can be mad if I comment. Oh, oh, yes, oh, please, oh, please. Yeah, okay, done. so uh, Jojo Rabbit was also on my list of five when I thought there was going to be five, and it was actually my number four, so it barely missed the cut. And I also was like, as long as someone's talking about it, uh, I have thoughts on it as well. I think to comment to that, what I really appreciate is it's uh, all about the timing and the setting of it. Uh, I remember when hearing the idea for this for this for this movie, I was like, I don't know if this is gonna work. And he toes that line, Taika Waititi toes that line in a way that I've only seen Mel Brooks really been able to pull off. Oh yeah. And I think it has everything to do with the timing. Uh, I think it. It offsets it because this isn't a movie at the beginning of the Holocaust. It's near the end of World War II. There's all a lot of the talk is about really what are we preparing for? We're getting pushed back, and you know the only other people. And I think it, it does a really good job at what I think is what I liked is that it didn't portray as like oh well some Nazis aren't that bad it's no is that there are other people involved in Nazi Germany like the character of Scarlett Johansson who she's like I'm German I love this country but I'm sick of this war I don't agree with it I don't like what it's doing and like that is the thing there is the other element in that uh there are people who are not Nazis who are just there and it's, you know, they're guilty by association but even then it's like just because they're there doesn't mean they want what's happening to happen and yeah, Moe's, uh, the character Sam Rockwell has that, he is one of the outliers but he just kind of seems over over it. Like he doesn't even really, and really when it comes down to the end he's more about what what he believes is right, but not about what to doing what's right, if that makes sense. I am talking about the ending. I'm trying not to spoil yeah. it. Uh, it gets hard because I don't want to spoil it for Ben. Uh, is that there are, there are the, I think there's nice that, there's no real nice Nazis. There are just complicated people who aren't Nazis. And then the ones, yeah, I think the ones that do get changed are the Sam Rockwell character, which I would say is... An argument, but yeah, the other side is they do a really good. Again, it doesn't forgive him. It doesn't forgive sure. him, but it does. I, I didn't. I didn't feel like he was forgiven. It was just more like, okay, there's a lot more. He is capable of doing the right, the right thing. thing given the right circumstance. He just yeah. hasn't up until this point. Well, let me let me and, ask you guys wait, this one more other okay. thing. Is that uh, and then they, I think they point out that JoJo isn't. He's not a Nazi because he believes in it. It's that he just wants to feel like he belongs to something. Yeah. And that is the saving race. It's not that he's a good Nazi. He's just a child. And he wants to be a part of a club, a group of people who he feels like. And we all, who hasn't at least once in their life thought, you know, these people seem cool. I should hang with them because they're my friends. And you hopefully you at a certain point go, Ooh, actually, I just like having friends, but these are not good friends, and I need to maybe step away from this. You outgrow people eventually. You do, and I, I so I think there, and I think that is actually the beauty of the movie is that there is an end in sight. It's not the heart of the matter; it's really the tail end of yeah. this thing, and you see it all unravel in that way. Is and that's what I liked is that no Nazi was innocent, but not every German person was guilty, yeah. and that's what I think was that was my takeaway from it. Well, let me ask you: Is this? I mean. The last movie Taika Waititi did before this was, of course, Thor Ragnarok. And, and you, I, I can't remember if this was in a review or a podcast or when we were just talking, Mo, but I remember you you brought up the fact that in Ragnarok there is an element of, you know, characters in that film fighting against, you know, an oppressive fascist force it was, you know, embodied by the Jeff Goldblum character. Is, is, is Jojo Rabbit continuing some of those themes and like they're becoming the the whole movie and instead of just a, a part of a larger tapestry well it's the, Ragnarok very much feels like an outlier in terms of his filmography I've, I've gone back and watched a bunch of his movies um uh, for starters, the script for Jojo Rabbit was written before, like back in like 2010 or something. Okay. Um, so that explains a lot, because it definitely feels a lot more like his older movies than Thor Ragnarok. Because a lot of his old movies, uh, stuff like um, Boy, Hunt for the Wilder People, and Eagle vs. Shark, these are movies that are about 
child, children or childlike figures who have their these fantasies that they have clash up against reality and what happens when that schism hap- uh, occurs when they have to face the fact that like what they believed especially in regards to a surrogate father figure or a real father figure um, when what they believe uh, falls apart and how do they how do they reconcile those two things Jojo Rabbit is very much about that because it it's about his adoration for for you know the Nazi party and for Hitler as his imaginary best friend and then what happens when he realizes the, what these people are saying isn't isn't true what what they what they believe isn't right and what's what it's doing to these to this country to these people is inhumane um, so Ragnarok definitely Ragnarok's a whole other discussion. I'm not going to go into it. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely, it feels like, a, even before I saw it, I was like, this feels like his sort of story. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, yeah, I, I loved it. I would say, I would agree. I think Thor Ragnarok was an opportunity he was given, and he was like, yeah, I want to do this, but I want to make it weird. And I think, there, I think he was one of those, again, Marvel trusting a director, and I think... I think it reeks of him, like, just the dialogue and how everything's delivered and the funness of it. But I wouldn't say... I would say other than realizing you got to fight for what's right is really the only common theme, I feel like. I mean, it would be hard to to compare Jeff Goldblum's character to the Nazi party. (laughs) That's a really big ask. But uh, I think he... Yeah, I would say that... Well, the the difference is it's about belief, because the Nazis were defined by their... Because in this film, at least, they are defined by their beliefs. And Mm -hmm. Jeff Goldblum, in, in the Grandmaster in Ragnarok, doesn't have any. He just sure. he just likes being in power and making people fight for his amusement. Those are very different kinds of people. Yeah. I, I had a, a nice, funny... We were literally talking yesterday about uh, neo-Nazis and... Uh, my boyfriend and I, I joked that I said, I was like, I feel like most neo-Nazis and regular Nazis, I would say at least a nice percentage of them are just suppressing being gay. And I said, it has everything to do with the fabulous outfits. They're all, it's like, it's, it's not the ones that just hate black people or Jewish people. It's the ones that are also like the really neat boots, the tight haircut, and very into the, like, the personal, like, fashion of it. And I, I love that it kind of gets explored with uh, Alfie Allen's character, who's like the second-hand man to Sam Rockwell. And there's... Alfie Allen? I didn't even know. Yeah. And he's... Uh, and he definitely... There's... There's, there's, there's some, some like, question. It's like, you're like, are they gay? Or is this just weird? Because it's like... Because it's like... Oh, like, at one point, Sam Rockwell's like, give me a cape! Like, and that's why I'm like... I think there is some part of this. I'm just like... Oh. So it is funny we're talking about like that. I was like, I think I think fancy neo Nazis might just be a little gay when it comes to like when you have to also address the appearance and clean cut nature of it and how that's a factor. Most people would go, no, I don't think that's an element, but okay. <laughs> and I love that it is slightly explored a little bit. Yeah. So there is some fun stuff there. Well, heading into the home stretch, Max, what is the final movie? What well, is the, the number movie two pick? Talking? My number yes, two pick. Yeah, because your number already, two pick at the end. We talked about my number one film already. If you uh, haven't heard about that, go back and listen to it because I'm not going to mention it again. Uh, my number two is actually Booksmart. Woo! I love Booksmart. I dug it. It's one of the few movies this year I have seen twice in theaters. I, I that I honestly am just like, I need to buy this movie as soon as possible. Uh, I think going into it I was like you know this might just be a female super bad but that's okay I think there are some stories that warrant just like a gender swap we are just talking but funnily enough I was talking about this with my dad it's like you can take some stories and like oh we're gonna do the same story but we're gonna flip it to be a woman and it's like it doesn't change anything I was like and I think this is one of those things, it does change something being a teenage woman in it changes school, a lot it changes a lot and the fact like trying to fit in and I think I think this movie does a really wonderful job uh Olivia Olivia Wilde directed it for directorial debut, right? I think yep. feature. Yeah. Yep. At the very least, for feature debut. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if she's done some like TV. Yeah, and that. she's amazing. Catelyn Catelyn Dever and Beanie Feldstein play the main two characters. They have played it safe their whole life, and even though they're going to a good college, so does everybody else who just basically decided to fuck around and do all the fun stuff and 
Beanie feels upset because she's like, we played it safe and we got exactly what everybody else did, but we had no fun. So they want to do one night of fun. So this, the premise isn't too far out from the other one, but I laughed so hard. They do enough different things, and it's just enough time away from Super Red. They can do new things. Uh, also, the cast is amazing. We have Jessica Williams, Jason Sudeikis, uh, Lisa Kudrow, Will Forte. Billy Lord. Billy Lord, who kills the yes, entire... Yeah. Like, and Billy Lord is the daughter of uh, Carrie Fish, the late yep. Carrie Fisher. And by she, proxy, the granddaughter of the late Debbie Reynolds and, and Eddie Fisher. And she was in a show called Screen Queens, and she was phenomenal in that. Even I though like, I got Screen to the... Queens. Once I got to the end of Screen Queens, I was like, I really don't need any more of this. But whoever played that one girl, Billy Lord stole the show and once again she steals the show again and it's nice because I know that she's probably spent some time processing you know some grief and to yes. see her just come out here and leave even though not the main character of the movie stole my heart she's so funny she's so funny and just this is, and she leads into some of the best scenarios uh, I don't I don't want to again I don't like talking about it because like you should just go see it it's, it's a comedy so it's tough to talk about it is because yes, you just want to like, talk about the all joke. the great things but <laughs> One of the best sequences that I was wondering how long it would actually go on for, and I didn't care if it went on for the rest of the movie, is at one point they take some drugs inadvertently, oh, yeah. and they turn into dolls, Barbie dolls. Yeah. And to see it play out in front of me, <laughs> I was I was going to die. And there are some movies you're like, you watch, you're like, oh, this was funny, because you don't see it coming. But uh, we got together with some friends, we're like, what should we watch? They're like, oh, Booksmart's playing. I was like... I'll see it again. And I laughed just as much, except this time it was nice because once I laughed so much I had to pee, I could actually get up and go. And it shot beautifully. That's the other thing is I think oh, Olivia, it's a I, I feel yeah. so sad that, I mean, everybody's talking about Greta Gerwig and the exclusion of female directors. I think we should definitely talk about Olivia Wilde as well. And she, it's nice, it's nice to know it's not just some actor trying to do directing. She has a beautiful eye. She, whoever did the cinematography on it was great and there's there's just some sequences where talking just doesn't matter and she knows exactly when that is the, the soundtrack is beautiful uh, and I'm not gonna lie I cried at the end it was and then immediately laughed afterwards so and uh, I would say is this new territory probably not but in this year there's a lot of things out there to feel depressed about Booksmart is not one of them it's a great bet if you don't mind raunchy humor you'll love this movie because it's just good it's good from start to finish and it's good a second time around you'll go back for more and all the most now mind you the, a lot of those names that I mentioned that you probably recognize have maybe one or two scenes in it but they work those scenes oh, yeah. so well I think there's two scenes with Jason Sudeikis two scenes with Lisa Kudrow and Will Forte both amazing scenes. I'm now like, oh yeah, those were great scenes, and yeah, I would, I would say I loved it. I 100. I was like, if I'm gonna talk about one movie, if I'm gonna talk about three movies that I think you should see, I was like, I had to make sure Booksmart was one of them. Endgame was also on my list, but everybody's seen Endgame. I think it's more of a, a feat that they finished it off, and uh, Rocket Man was on my list. Just a good time, but I was like, you know, those are just my honorable mentions. I'm getting them in now. <laughs> I, I got two things I want to say about books. Please one, go. One, one, oh, one stop is a, me. It's a question. Yes. Um, mm. uh, but, but the first thing I want to say is that uh, I think the thing I like most about this movie is. Uh, so you I, did, did you see it? I did, yeah. Okay. Uh, did you see it? I did see it. Okay, good. We, uh, we, we, we also saw, we also book smart. Yay. We are book smart. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. It's For a me. Uh, <laughs> It's a. Like it's it's a time capsule movie in a good way, like because you know, people often talk about like the idea of uh, you know movies feeling dated. No, that that's not something that ever bothers me. I like when a movie really captures its moment. So, for instance, like you have uh, you know that the great shot at the beginning where you see there's an Elizabeth Warren bumper sticker on their car. Yeah. You know. Whatever happens with this coming, uh, you know, primary and election, that's, you know... It, that could any, be funny, yeah, yeah, it, it could be, be inspiring. Yeah, yeah. If, but uh, it feels real. Yeah, it feels real. It's a very specific detail, you know, and I also, I I just, I like that, you know, it's specific, it's not some made-up candidate, you yeah. know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, just, and the same thing with, like, you know, Jason Sudeikis playing the principal, you know, being their Lyft or Uber driver. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's such a kind of a calming experience of this time where it's like, you know... 
you're hopefully either, in you're either riding with someone you know who you didn't expect to on a on a shared one or you know you're being driven by someone you know it's like oh I didn't know you were driving you know for Lyft or Uber now like is the as the kind of the, the as the economy shifts and you know it's like more people you know are like using that as you know a Way source to of income you know needs. that's a really kind of I think cool interesting detail of um, America at this moment to key into good lord it and was such a comment and it was it was funny but you're right like hopefully in the future we will be like hopefully in the next five or ten years we'll look back we're watching this movie and have people go wait if he's a principal why does he need to Uber we if could he go, has a well, job in education which pays well enough that no one needs to supplement their income by joining the fucking gig economy yeah yes. well and yes. I also specifically <laughs> love that he's not just a teacher like Tina Fey was in Mean Girls like take it a step further going no 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 if you work in education no one gets paid enough yes. even yes. like even if you're the top dog you're still a Lyft driver and yes. that's why I'm like you know yeah so hopefully coming from a family of educators I think teachers could never be paid enough <laughs> everyone agrees and uh, Seconded. I think it's yeah so I, I really hope that it is something that we can maybe look back on some of these things and be like ah well, it was just what was happening hopefully things get better uh, what was your question well I want to move on to my final pick in a sec but I, I did want to ask you guys one um, and uh, for, forgive me as I as I try to formulate what I want to ask because I'm <laughs> kind of figuring it out uh, cool. as I talk. But like, I'm kind of a I'm thinking a lot about the premise of the movie and the idea of like they them feeling like oh like we you know we wanted to party in high school but we didn't because we thought that would help us you know get into better colleges than all those other kids who are getting shit fixed basically and um uh, and, and then as a result you know they end up you know going on this kind of a uh, night long odyssey to find this <laughs> one party that leads them into some you know crazy misadventures that we've alluded to and uh at the end, they do make it to the party, and it's uh, it both is and isn't what they'd hope for. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I I just wonder if you guys have any thoughts about like the you know the what the movie is saying with that that journey. Is it saying that you know kind of what they're searching for the whole night is ultimately hollow, or that it's it's partly hollow and it's kind of worth it to have that last great night I'm just I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that I mean that's just kind of Hollywood screen stru- screen stru- screenwriting structure it's it's you the character it's one versus need it's what they what what they wanted was just to, you know have fun for one night while they were high school students. What they needed was this entire journey of self realization and actualization and, and knowing <coughs> testing their bonds, but ultimately reaffirming it. Um, plus, you know, a teenage house party makes for a good is a good source of drama. So let's spend the whole third act there. Sure. Um, I think it. I think it's a. I think it's a little bit of both. I think you realize that it is possible to go out and have fun, or you know, do crazy things. Like they said, they're just like. There's one guy who doesn't even get into college, and she's just like, "I know you're not going to college." He was like, "Oh no, but I spent a lot of my time coding, and now I'm going to go work for Google or Apple or whatever it is." <laughs> and he's just like, "I mean, sure, it doesn't pay a lot, but I'm hoping it'll give me room to grow." Like even within that, like success is measured by how, well, how you define it. And uh, I do. There's just a lot of like come arounds, and I think we all come full circle with a lot of characters. Like you, they present them as one thing, but then you like spend a little more time you're like oh there's more happening here um, oh, yeah. but I do think that that's ultimately no, like, they, they do want this adventure they want the fun but really like when it comes down to it and you ultimately leave it is really about like the bonds you make and you know like they had fun hanging out doing nerdy things and they would have been fine without a knife but I think yeah I think the truth lies somewhere in the middle but I think the mo- ultimate one is you don't need f- you know, a bunch of friends and crazy stories, but you need one good friend who you can create all your fun stories with. And you're like, and that's just enough sometimes. And it's okay to be satisfied with that. You didn't lose out. Like, that's really like, she goes, I don't lose out. Like, even if she, once she finally gets the party and presented with all the things that she felt like she wanted, 
what she ultimately ends up with is still her best friend at the end. Spoilers. And I think that's and that's important to remember. I also, I, I've said this a lot of times before, but this was the year, uh, 2019 was the year that the show Euphoria came out on HBO. Yeah. Mm. Um, I watched that show. It's a lot of, it's, it is about this sort of thing about teenagers um, living in, uh, in their sort of complex inner lives. And a lot of it centers on parties and, and drug addiction and alcoholism. And I'm like, I never, I was never, in high school I was never the type to do drugs. I never went to keggers, never did any crazy stuff like that. And sometimes it felt like I was missing out, like it was an incomplete experience. And then I watched this show and I'm like, oh, <laughs> these kids are fucking miserable. <laughs> I am so glad I spent my Saturday night staying home, watching cartoons and eating pizza. That sounds so much better than, than doing so much drugs that your body forgets how to pee. Uh, I feel like Euphoria is written by somebody who actually partied, and they're like, it's like, we're warning you. I know I'm only 25, and yeah, I'm a writer, but I narrowly have missed, like, an alcohol addiction, and I think, and, or alcoholism, and I think that is a, that is a message for that. It's like, you know, there are some things. Yeah. Some things. <laughs> I would say something, but I don't think I need to because I think you guys both summed right. it Nailed up. Nailed it. Beautiful. <laughs> All right. And that was the sound of a high five, not a can of black. I just, may sound I just smacked Mo in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> well, it's not a THO movie whose podcast is, you know, someone doesn't get slapped at this once. But, um, we just call that a wake-up call. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So my final movie that I'm going to talk about. It's not my favorite movie of the year, but um, uh, I, I love it, love it, love it. I'm more than happy for it to be the last one that I talk about. And, uh, you know, as we were talking about earlier, not necessarily liking being scared, but this is a horror movie. It's Midsummer. Oh, thank God. Ooh. <laughs> Again, I just kept worrying that Joker was going to come up. <laughs> I don't think it's really a horror movie, but... <laughs> I mean, there's... Uh, okay. Debatable. <laughs> Midsummer. Uh, Midsummer. Midsummer. Yeah, I did not see it. I, can I just say real quick before you yeah. go? I'm honestly surprised. I did not think it was going to be Midsummer. <laughs> like even though it was like, what horror movie could you be talking about? But uh, did, did, like, what did you see? I did. Summer. Okay. I saw it as soon as I could before it could get I, spoiled. I, I read a synopsis online and I saw bits and pieces because we had it at, at the Fox Tower for a while. So I did. I saw it in theater checks. All right. So Midsummer. It's um uh, about a young woman named Danny, played by Florence Pugh, and uh, the film opens with uh, one of the most sickening tragedies that I've seen on screen in recent memory. Her. Uh, her sister uh, murders their parents and also kills herself. And uh, I would say just, spoiler, but it's in the first five minutes. Yeah, yeah. and it's an exciting ju- incident. And at the and uh, her her no, boyfriend her of uh, Christian, played by Jack Rayner, is about to break up with her right before this happens. So you know, because she's going through this agonizing time, he stays with her while being, you know, allowing resentment to kind of you know coalesce and you know you know. Being this, you know, horrible, you know, passive-aggressive partner when the kindest thing to do would be to just, you know, dump her because her his uh, his quote-unquote comfort is really making things worse in a lot of ways. But uh, what the real meat of the movie is, uh, he with some of his friends are going to this uh, uh, festival. festival, a pagan. Uh, gathering, if you will. It happens every 90 years in Sweden. And so uh, Danny, not wanting to be alone, decides to tag along with him. And uh, basically it's a, it becomes a sort of slow-burning suspense or comedy where you gradually get the feeling that uh, there might be something sinister going on with this pagan cult because I mean, huh, like people, pagan cult people, is never a good starting point. And nobody and, you ever know, once said a virgin career in pagan and, cultism. <laughs> and there's a there's a bear in the cage. What's that doing there? You know, like why is this bear just a lot of What could they be planning to use it for later at the very end of the film? But um, uh, there are some people who um, uh, for very legitimate reasons take this film literally. They literally think it is about you know, like a group of young festival. Americans going to on a vacation to a this pagan festival turns into a horror show. That's a perfectly legitimate approach. I am not one of those people. I do not take anything in this movie except maybe the beginning, literally. I was, uh, 
I think this is really all about the character of Danny and what she's going through. And I, I hesitate to say that this all happens inside her head because to me, like that's that's too banal. You know, it's it, that's too simple. But I think that the uh, the the cult and the uh, the increasingly gruesome rich rituals they go through are a kind of uh, manifestation of you know what she's going through and her realizing that she's in this uh, toxic relationship and has to kind of purge that from her soul and it comes to this really extraordinary climax that is uh, that I think is really one big brutal and beautiful metaphor where she's literally kind of uh, erasing that toxicity as if by fire and uh, it ends with this smile that is both chilling and wonderful. And uh, I, I just, I find it to be a really moving film. And I, I think there's a lot of great, uh, great comedy to be had because there's, you know, in the, the kind of the barbaricness of the festival, because there's a scene where um, uh, the, the Americans watch this ritual in which uh, two members of the cult, you know, jump off a cliff and, you know, die in a really gruesome way and you know one of the guys afterward you know says you know of course I'm freaked out but I'm trying to keep an open mind I mean it's cultural <laughs> I... and just the kind of the comedy of these like of these it, these dumbass you know Americans like you know like kind of you know like trying to be quote unquote open minded you know even though it's obvious that sinister doings are afoot but then just you know the really I, th- I think kind of beautiful storyline of you know Danny who I, I just think is so beautifully portrayed by Florence Pugh realizing I uh, I deserve more than this guy I deserve better than this and uh, there's a there's a great scene where another character says to her you know, do you feel held by him and it's a it, it's a great it's a great question and I think it's a I think that's like kind of a, a fascinating sort of acid test and I, I think it's that that you know makes this movie you know entertainingly scary and nasty, but also I think really, really poignant and effective, and I highly recommend it. Uh, I also saw Midsummer in theaters, and uh, it's from the director Ari Aster, who did right. Hereditary. So yep. when you were like the most terrific thing I've seen in theaters, I would say since that one scene in Hereditary. <laughs> yep. uh, I think the scene with the ants, or the, the one with the, the next stab. <laughs> oh man, which part? Where do you even begin? How, how do you choose? Uh, but I meant I was thinking specifically the scene in Hereditary with the uh, just everything from the allergic reaction on to I'm sure yep. we all know where. Uh, I, I what I loved about Midsummer is I really felt like I do agree with you. I think there's it's ripe with metaphor. This is clearly a fake country. It's a fake festival. It's a fake cult but I mean I think it, it's rooted in a lot of truths I think it's easy to just like I think Emo- emotional truth I, yeah I and say. I feel like I, I would say I felt I fall into that line of uh, people who take it literally I do think it's a literal story but I think what you're learning and how it's presented and how it's packaged and how it all like plays out is the metaphor and the lesson you're supposed to learn from it. Sure. Uh, you're right. It is laughable. Uh, I remember thinking while I was watching this is because you have the boyfriend uh, who's played by... Jack uh, Rager. Jack Rager. Great. He was great. He also pushed for a lot... Of, he pushed for full frontal male nudity as a metaphor um, in a way that I think was very progressive. And, yes. And not... And given everything that was going on, not, not uh, excessive. It was... But each man kind of plays like a different toxic. I really felt like a lot about a lot about toxic masculinity. Absolutely. At least the men were. Because I mean, he's like the nice guy toxic masculinity. Like, I felt for a while he's. Well, just he's not like, even that nice. Well, really. He, I mean, well, like that. Like his whole reasoning is it is because he's a nice guy. Like he's like I don't want to break up with her. Like at the beginning because he's like she's going through a lot of stuff. Her sister's acting a little weird. I don't want to put that on her. And he ultimately just like his friends are like, dude, you need to cut this off. They're terrible enablers, but he should because she deserves better than this guy yeah. we just don't realize it until later and then his sister does or her sister does what she does and then they're still together eight months later because he's like I can't break up with her she just went through this whole thing it's like he feels like he's like I can't do these things to her when really she would have been better off if she had just let, like left her alone in a long way she wouldn't have ended up here um I will also comment that the shroom sequence is uh, one of the most, like, how things move in the background was one of the most realistic drug-tripping experiences. I was just like, wow, they 
nailed that. It's not always like a crazy wild adventure. Sometimes it's just some things you just see. Uh, but my question is, uh, what is what do you think is what did you think of the overall? Did you get the commentary about toxic masculinity? Because I feel like each man kind of plays a different role, but he plays the most important role because he's the worst kind, the one that sticks around and poisons the water hole because he feels like he's like he's in turn doing the right thing yeah. by not breaking her heart not offending these people but really there's something darker going on I, I guess did you get any of that vibe from it like did you Absolutely. pull the toxic yeah. masculinity I, from that I love I love that you you brought that up and, and by the way I would say it's it's been a great year for movies dealing with toxic masculinity because there's been a in, it's the whole spectrum yep. of mm. that thing has been dealt with I think in really interesting ways in a lot of movies this year I mean I, I, I like that you have very different uh, archetypes of toxic masculinity you have you know the, the Jack Rayner character who's um, uh, like kind of it kind of a uh, I don't know to put it in the most cliched way the the wolf and in, in sheep's clothing like you know you know it starts with him basically you know talking her out of her feelings saying you know you know don't worry about your sister man she's always just trying to scare you yeah and like, right and the kind of the the sympathetic interpretation is oh he's trying to comfort her and you know help her not getting freaked out the uh, the less sympathetic interpretation the one that I take is that. You know, he believes that she's not entitled to her feelings and is almost literally trying to say they shouldn't exist and trying to control her. And I would say it's the reason he's, he sticks around is just sort of for the pleasure of doing that. And he kind of uh, almost literally gets off on suppressing her. But then you get you get really different, like, uh, you know, d- different... I don't know. I don't know, different you know versions of toxic masculinity with his friends because you know you have uh, uh, the uh, Will Poulter's character who is a much more vulgar version than Jack Raider's character. The guy who um, uh, you know his defining moment is when he pees on a sacred ancestral tree. You yeah. know, and which is one thing if you don't realize it, it's another thing to be like. I don't give a shit. Yeah, like, yeah. what are you really upset? Like, like, it's a tree. Like, yeah, it's like you know, just, like and and by the way, this is not like like off. You know, he's off in a corner, like you know, in the brush. He's literally in a field where a tree is lying. You know, it's, taking, a, it's like a dead tree taking out fallen. his dick, and you know, in front of everybody, and being on a dead tree, and like the like most like like crass. You know, kind of you know, masculinity, and then then you see other versions. You know, there's another character, another friend, who's more of like a a colder, more academic. He's a version. like a scholarly toxic man. Like, have you noticed? Yes. That there's. I know who you're talking about. He's uh, from the good place. He is William Jackson. Really? Yes. Thank you. Yes. I was just about to look it up. I was gonna bring him up. I like that his toxic masculinity kind of comes in the form of everything's cool until you try to take his thing. That's when he goes off the rail. Like, like all of a sudden, it wasn't his. Um, and I don't know. I think they. I love that this movie kind of like breaks down these characters to a point that when whatever terrible fate happens to him, you don't really feel bad. Like, at the yeah. end, I really felt like I should have felt bad for some of the, specifically the fates of one of these characters. But by the end of it, you just you reach this point, and you're just like, yep, good for her. Like, there's yeah. that wonderful meme of people at the end of Mid- Midsummer. They watch the ending, and they don't good for her <laughs> yeah. and, see, and here's, the, here's the thing and here's here's what it comes down to like you know depending how you uh, how you interpret the movie if you interpret it metaphorically or literally or somewhere in between like if the the most literal interpretation would be at the end when she fully asserts her power in a very violent way you feel you see it as a tragedy you see it as oh he he drove her to become a monster you know the the the, the in between interpretation is like you know well maybe she's a bit monstrous but he had it coming the the interpretation that's metaphorical and the one again that I subscribe to is that what we're seeing is, is not something this is actually happening but a kind of a cinematic representation of what we all go through where we're um, uh, when we're kind of escaping from you know people who are poisoning our souls and that you kind of 
and the, the sort of the recovery process emotionally is violent and is barbaric and it is in some ways like in some cases like cutting off a limb or you know or in the case of the movie uh, lighting it on fire you know? but, um, uh, and, that, and that's why like I can never like watch that smile at the end and, and feel like you know like Oh god, she's evil. It's like no, I feel like she's. I, think I feel it, like she's whole again. I really feel like they build up the story enough that you don't feel you don't feel that way. You're finally like, oh, good. Yes. Good for her. Again, yes. good yeah. for her. They really. I I loved Midsummer for that reason. Actually, I think it's. I like it better than Hereditary because I feel like I, I do could, too. I yes. can emotionally watch it with a little with a little more like. I'll be fine at the end. Hereditary yeah. hurts so bad. And See, it's so look, Heredi- Hereditary like is so effectively terrifying. Like, it's insane how effective that movie is. But, you know, kind of getting back to the idea, like we were talking about earlier, Mo, of, like, not necessarily liking being scared. Like, like even if I can recognize Hereditary's effectiveness, I, I don't want to feel that way particularly often, you know? <laughs> Whereas, like, Midsummer, like, this kind of, like, slow, you know, churning Hitchcockian tear, you know, where it's kind of, like... You know, the suspense is gradually ratcheting up and it's unsettling, but also kind of amusing. Well, you know, it's and it's like, more about suspense than than horror, even though, you know, there's certainly blood and guts. You it's know? definitely reminiscent of Wicker Man, where it's like, it's creepy to look at. Not the one with Nick Cage, <laughs> the original, no, no. where you're like, Not the bees! Yeah, yeah, not the bees. But uh, where, I mean, like the original, where you're just like, you're looking at things, you're like, I'm unnerved and I'm uncomfortable and you're like but is it is this part of it or is this something scary I should be afraid of and yes. I think it definitely leaves you on that footing for a long time well we have to wrap up yes I don't, I don't want to exhaust you guys but uh, with your permission I'd like to ask you one final question sure okay so I mean I mean last year we kind of we got a little bit meta we talked about the process of you know choosing a favorite film of the year and like you know what that means to each of us you know kind of what that's like to go through because i think you know as as you guys know it's a it it can be sometimes more complicated than people would think it's not always obvious sometimes it requires a little soul searching i I wanted to in that vein ask you guys um uh, and i can go first if you need a minute to think about it but i mean i mean just you know so much of what we do as critics revolves around making lists and they can be fun, they can be absurd, they can be a little bit of both. Either way, it's this inescapable part of People like what lists. we do. Mm-hmm. And I just, I wonder, like, like what, I mean, like, what, what's you guys' attitude toward lists in general? Do you think film criticism emphasizes them too much? Do you think they're a kind of necessary part of it? And, and if so, like, what do you think... What do you think they offer? What do you think they, they they give us both, you know, in terms of us as critics making them and, you know, in terms of, you know, readers or listeners absorbing them? So you're asking uh, what lists do for us as critics or what lists do for everyone or a little bit of both? I would say a little bit of both, but whatever, whatever part of the question you want to dive into. Um, how about you go first? Sure. Uh, what, like... Yeah, let you first. <laughs> I think, you know, I mean, like, I I tend to have, like, like kind of a jokey attitude about lists. Like, you know, oh, ha, ha, I'm making another list. Like, <laughs> like you know, for instance, now that the Star Wars sequel trilogy is complete, I've been doing something I've been looking forward to, which is uh, making... Uh, ranking all night? Ma- well, well, no, actually, I'm, uh, well, I want to do that, too, but I'm uh, <laughs> ranking the, the best moments of the of the sequel trilogy and you know which um uh, once you've put the um the fight with uh snoke's guards at number one it's actually quite hard <laughs> figuring out what falls up but and, and you know with and i just i love doing stuff like that because i feel that you know as ridiculous as lists can be and as absurd as it can be like you know getting into you know splitting hairs of like well is this movie or this performance you know like a hair better than this one you know, as silly as that can get, like, I really think that lists are a chance to express something, you know, and I I do think it's kind of, I think it's really fun to, you know, say, hey, you know, this performance, this movie, or this scene, like, I value it this much, or I value this above, you know, the others on this list. You know, we talk about movies being our children, but, and definitely we have emotional relationships to them, but they are also 
objects, and that enables us to you know do what we would hopefully never do with an actual child, which is you know <laughs> kind of them. ranking them to express something about what means the most to us. So that's 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 my personal take on it. Um, Mel, do you have an opinion or? Um, I just think list it's it's. I'd say they're easier to write. I mean, easy to read. It's just, it's a quickie top. You, you, you get the topic up front, you get just like little bits of, um, you can you can skim it, you can just be like, oh, number 10 was this one, I don't feel like reading more about that, number 9 was this one, oh, what does they say about that? Da, 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 da. Um, it's, it's a format, it's just, an, it's another... It's just a way of I, I I didn't I haven't put too much thought into it. It's just a way of organizing things. Um, yeah, I don't have much to say on this subject. I'm sorry. Uh, no. I mean, as one of my favorite, as one of our favorite YouTubers say, uh, the internet likes lists. Uh, <laughs> and uh, her name is Jenny Nicholson, and regularly she goes, "I made a numbered list, but the numbers are arbitrary." And she'll give <laughs> the numbers you- are just. Things she wants, the art. She's already decided what she wants to talk about. Yeah, uh, they're one of my favorite videos. Is uh, ten favorite things that I like to do at Halloween. It's her video, and when she opens it up, she goes, uh, "Here's just some things." I said there was ten because it's clickbaity. I think there are people who like lists. As a person, when it comes to uh, picking the movies out, uh, I sit down every year and I just I go to a website that has listed everything by release date, and I literally make a list. And then when you're like, oh rank them and I'm like okay then I just do start breaking them apart I'm like you know what do I want to watch again like what stuck with me and I think it's easier to make a list uh, now if you had told me to list 10 things I love about Parasite I could do it but I think by doing it breaks it down so much that I, I couldn't do it without giving everything about the movie away it really only does somebody some good I think some lists are good for that but as a person who has also followed lists uh, I recently did the I, last year I listened to the 500 greatest albums of all time as ranked by Rolling Stone 10 years ago and there is something about seeing that list of and you listen to one album and you're like oh okay this is good then you listen to the next one and you're like wait this one they think this <laughs> one is somehow better than this one or even a much more topical one is the Rolling Stone 50 best albums of the year uh Last year was a great year for music for me. To have me narrow down ten would have been really hard. But this mm. year has been a really hard time picking just five that I've listened to. I've listened to a lot of stuff that came out a year or two years ago. This year hasn't widely impressed me, except for Lizzo's Because I Love You, the deluxe edition, because the extra songs are important. But on Rolling Stone, they listed as their number six best album of the year. She's up for album of the year at the Grammys. And what they have higher rated is uh, Norman Fucking Rockwell by Lana Del Rey. And when listening to both albums, that Lana Del Rey album is phenomenal. It's beautiful. She does something new with it that I don't expect from her. But I'm still listening to Lizzo more. And that is the (laughs) thing about List is I think it gives you a good barometer. And this is why I, I recently told someone, I was like, not all critics are about bad reviews for clicks. What you need to do is find somebody who you can kind of meld with. They're like, I feel this way about a movie. You're like, I also feel that way about a movie. It gives you a barometer of, if this person likes it, I might also like it. And I think that's really what we do by breaking down lists. Hopefully somebody is listening to this because, oh, they all really liked Parasite or, you know, like it was on a lot of people's list. Maybe that will drive them to go see a movie that is maybe technically good, maybe they'll like it, but ultimately they could still go see Parasite, which was on two of our lists, and listen to Lizzo and hate both. <laughs> like, and there's there's also something to I found something to say. There's also, there's also something to just be Take like I wanna talk about more than one thing. Like yes. I just I, I'm not gonna I don't wanna say like this was my favorite movie of the year. It's just like there was a lot of movies that were my favorite movie of the year. I watched a lot of stuff that I liked that I feel like talking about that I think or that I think should get more attention. Um, like there, there was a, uh, at one of the Academy Awards. There, I, I believe it was Jack Nicholson who was presenting for Best Picture, and he says the mo- the movies that don't win for this award will join the ranks of like Midnight Cowboy and yep. Taxi Driver, and it's like yeah because. Maybe they Although did. I think Midnight Cowboy won. I, I don't remember. Either way. I don't remember what the, the po- exact list, but the point is, it's even if it doesn't get the one award, that doesn't mean 
it didn't mean something to people. It doesn't mean it wasn't deserving of it. That doesn't mean it should be excluded and forgot about. So I, you know, I, I, I put together a quickie list of like, um, what are what were my ten favorite movies of the of the decade, or at least what were like I think the best ones or the most influential. Not all of them are going to win awards. Not all of them uh, are even going to be nominated. But it doesn't mean that they they didn't leave a legacy. Yes. And I feel like for Liz, that's you have the flexibility to do that. Yes, I think that's so true. And also, I think um, uh, you know, as much as people try to promote the myth of critical consensus, whether through cinema score or Rotten Tomatoes, it, it truly is a myth. It's fake. It's, you know, it's as fake as unicorns and dragons. You can find every movie, you will be able to find someone who loves it and someone who hates it. You know, I've even, I've, you know, I've talked to people who, you know, don't, I've talked to at least one person who doesn't like The Godfather. You know, I mean, there's always someone. You know, and that's, and that's what's beautiful about this whole thing. And, and that's another reason why I like lists. You know, you're... Your list is yours. It's going to be unique. It's a, you know, it's, it can be a statement of like the movies that matter to you in a year or in a decade. And it's therefore, I think, like one of the most succinct forms of self-expression you can have as a, as a critic. You know, and I just, I just made and published my own decade list. And it was, uh, it was, it was thrilling because, you know, like just to be able to say like, these were the movies that, uh, mattered the most to me. Not the movies that were the most important or the most profitable, but but these were, you know, the ones in particular that, you know, I'm, you know, gonna watch and rewatch, you know, for years and in some cases already have done, you know what I mean? And that's that's exciting. That's I think one of the one of the one of the most fun parts about this this whole crazy ride we're on. Well, and I also think it's easier when you, when you break, and I think you really break it down really right there for you. It's like when you talk about a year, I think it's easy to go, there were 500 movies or so, whatever, released in this year. You're like, these 10, I love them because they made me feel something. Or yes. I think they're just technically a good film or they did this or that. The wider you break, let break that up to a decade, I'm just thinking, of like, I don't even know if half of my list would be considered technically good movies because... Even last year, when faced with the best of, I believe my pick for last year for favorite movie, and the one that also affected me most was Colossal. And it, yes. to this day, I that think was it's 2017. Was that 2017? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but even then, I still think that is by choosing what affected me. I was like, will Colossal be remembered into the future? Maybe not. I mean, I know a lot of people who've already like forgotten about it, or they never heard about it in the first place, and they probably never will. But if you asked me, it might be on my best of the decade because in that moment, at that time, it felt like it meant something to me. I think people should take these lists as not the decider of what is good, but more of a barometer of things to keep your eye out for. Uh, yeah. Another one of my favorite uh, <laughs> critics in Portland or film aficionados put up his list of 15. He did a list of 15. and Who was it? Uh, the person who runs the queer comedy, or not queer, queer horror at... Oh, yeah. Uh, at the Hollywood and I mean I think at least half of them were horror films mm -hmm. and almost none of them I had heard of but this person loves horror films and I really like horror films so I took some notes I was like Luz uh, what was the other one you mentioned The Perimeter uh, The Sentinel The Sentinel was that from this year that that, no, that movie came out in, like, 1978, oh. but we they showed it at Queer, Queer Horror this year. So, okay, there's another one. I'm just thinking of it. Oh, it almost sounded like. But the fact of the matter is that this person put up a bunch of movies, and I would say that are any of them going to be nominated? I would say maybe one or two, hopefully, but uh, he didn't go from that. And I think people who love him will go, oh, just like me. I was like, I want to see in the fabric at the movie about a haunted dress <laughs> like but that's who I am and that's yes. so hopefully I mean, that's why I'm always like listen to your critics because they do know something but formulate your own opinion yeah. and yes. that's just why like I didn't hear anything positive really or like overwhelmingly positive about Hustlers today until I sat down with both of you and I'm like okay I guess I'm gonna watch Hustlers now up until today I thought I'd never watch it <laughs> so <laughs> and that's just how uh, but that's because I I trust your guys' opinion so. Well, and uh, and I promise I really will wrap this up. <laughs> I love I love this. I love this topic. So I have to say at least a couple more things. I mean, like you, you're, you're 
I'm getting at, like, you know, how personal this kind of thing could be, like, what you were talking about, about colossal. And, you know, I remember uh, Manola Dargis once saying, you know, that one reason she'd kind of fallen out of love with Pauline Kael is she's felt that Pauline Kael was too obsessed with how movies made her feel. And she said, you know, there's more to um, a, you know, a movie that basically than how it makes a critic feel. But I, I come from a very different perspective because, you know, I, I do think that the colder, harder part of criticism, you know, the research, for instance, on a director or actor's career, you know, the, the kind of the reporting element, I think that's crucially important. I think, you know, it's something you have to master. But then at the same time, I feel like, like how you feel, your personal reaction, you know, that's something that is specific to you. That's what you can offer that no one else can. And I think if, you know, that doesn't come into at least some of your criticism, you know, you are, uh, you're, you're missing out on a, a huge, huge weapon in your arsenal that's going to make your, you know, writing unique and special and cathartic. I mean, like, one, you know, thing that really guided me when I was making my Best of the Decade list was that, you know, at the beginning of this uh decade uh like i you know fell in love and in a lot of ways it went very badly and a lot of the past you know decade has been like kind of working out on that and like you know last year was the year when i felt like i finally closed the book on that chapter in my life and so surprise surprise a lot of the movies on my list are about you know relationships that don't work out or you know getting over you know someone even you know Inception, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio saying to Marion Cotillard, you know, you know, we had our time together, but I, I have to let you go. I have to, you know, and I feel like that's, you know, you know, that's that's so that would that's, that was so much, you know, more satisfying for me to do than saying like, you know, like, well, you know, I'm going to, you know, put, you know, you know, boyhood at the top of the list because it was the most technically you know and narratively yeah. revolutionary film of the decade which you know there's an argument to me that it was you know and that's important as well and I think that should be written about now as well but I think you know it's uh, you, you can't discount the personal you can't discount the emotional because it's a uh, because it's art yeah that exactly is it's always going to be emotional yeah. yes yes the, technic- the technical aspect matters I'm not going to discount that but it I it, something I something that's been that has very much pissed me off for a while about criticism is the notion that objective criticism exists yes. and it doesn't people have different opinions they have different viewpoints a film is going to affect them differently than others and that's something there's no objective measure of a movie you can't do that because it's art that's not how art works yeah so yeah I mean, you never, you've never seen a director make a technically good film and then be like, I mean, it had no emotion, but technically it was great. Like, <laughs> the, what makes I mean, that's almost an oxymoron. Well, I mean, yeah. like, I mean, as much as Parasite is framed and shot beautifully, if it made me feel nothing, what load of good does it do? It doesn't, matter. It doesn't do anything. What yes. did you say? Is a pain is worth it as long as there's a point? Uh, yeah. And I mean, you could be a, a, the most beautiful movie in the world. I mean. Let's just, I mean, I hate to bring it up again, cats. Yeah. Technically, they felt like when they were going into that, they had it right, that this is the technology, was not going to be used for practical makeup, and we're going to spend all this money on this thing. And then it just, nobody liked it, nobody wanted it. And so now people are going, what did you spend $70 million? Actually, the greatest criticism I've heard is people going, you know, I get why they did the technical element. But I think they would have been better off with with practical makeup. And you know that before any of this all began, they're like, you know, we think with the effects today, we could really turn people into cats. And, like, again, from one end of the spectrum, sounds like a good idea. From the other end, it's not. So Your scientists are so busy with whether or not they could, they never stop to think of whether or not they could. <laughs> I think we should end on that. I think we should end on that, too, on a nice gold Bloomian note. Thanks, All cats. right. Well, if you like this podcast, please click thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at THO Movie Reviews. And please check out all the great reviews and content we have at THOMovieReviews.wordpress.com. Not THOMovieReviews.com, like I said in the previous podcast, oh, no. and had to cut out. So, uh, right. so, one more for the people what's the actual website? THOMovieReviews.wordpress.com. Wordpress. Wordpress. <laughs> Once again, I'm your host, Ben Campbell Ferguson, here with Mo Sharnett. 
here with Maxwell Myers and from all of us here at THM Movie Reviews, happy list making and consuming. <laughs>